through mountains and desert, beasts of burden have traveled to the city of Otrar, saddled with goods from the far east. The 400-man caravan slackens its pace before the famed Islamic metropolis, which glows with looming citadel and elegant contours of sandstone. Thereupon, the travelers meet the governor of the town, Inalchuk, to whom they reveal that they bear a bountiful trade offering from their master. For the warring, horse-bound nomads of the Golden Steppe have united under their lord. The Mongol riders now answer to the man called Temujin, the great Genghis Khan. Inelchuk sends word of this Mongol caravan to his nephew, Shah Mohammed II, the supreme ruler of Otrar in these lands known as the Khorasmian Empire. And with the blessing of the Shah Inelchuk, driven either by suspicion or greed, executes the entire caravan and sells its precious cargo for his own profit. Yet one traveler escaped the bloodshed, and now he treks back to report to Genghis Khan. The Mongol answer arrives in short order at the palace of Shah Mohammed, three meager emissaries. The men implore the Shah to make peace with Genghis Khan and to hand over Inalchuk for punishment. The Shah has heard tales of this Mongol empire. A few years ago, he sent an emissary to the city of Zhangdu or Beijing, China, the great pearl of the Jin dynasty. Walls that stretched 40 feet high concealed within a putrid vapor. For as the party advanced, the earth underfoot became slick with yellow pools of human fat, and what they perceived as banks of snow from a distance were chalky heaps of innocent bones. The Mongols have breached the Great Wall, and they are ravaging China. The Shah decides to arrest the three emissaries of the Khan. One he has killed. He forces the other two to return to Genghis Khan with their beards disgracefully shaven, carrying the head of their companion. The Shah does not fear war. Having recently annexed the eastern stretches of his domain and executed tens of thousands of civilians who resisted his rule, Shah Mohammed II styles himself a great conqueror, who answers neither to the Abbasid Caliph of Baghdad to his west, nor to strange Mongol nomads to his east. The edge of his empire ascends jagged in the east to form a great barrier of mountains. The Shah knows when the Mongols come to retaliate, they will march through the gap between its peaks, the Zungarian Gate. Khorasmian troops ride into position. But there is another pass, ancient and treacherous through the mountains of Tian Shan. A cold white wind torments all who trespass its ravines and sheer cliffs, and there frozen bows rattle against huffing beasts. Marching through white dunes and staggered corridors is a Mongol force of 30,000. Descending from the mountains, they plunder the Fergana Valley until the Shah leads his army after them. The Mongols, though outnumbered and travel-weary, display their unfailing discipline and mastery. In brilliant charges and feints of light cavalry, the synchronous packs of riders rain arrows into Khwarazmian ranks. The larger Khwarazmian force bleeds troops but manages to hold its ground, and at day's end, each side retires to its camp. The Mongols disappear under cover of darkness slip deeper into Khwarazmian territory. The Shah will learn that the army that has just repulsed his attack is only a vanguard force, led by the Khan's generals Jochi and Jebe. From the Zungarian gate, more are coming. Inalchuk has readied Otrar for war. The gates are shut, and his general Karacha commands the strong garrison. Lining the walls, the lookouts perceive a beating hum, galloping forth. It is said that then Inalchuk mounts his wall, and looking forth, finds no words, but bites the back of his hand in awe. For the air became blue, the earth ebony, the sea boiled with the noise of the drums. With his finger, he pointed to the army on the plain. 
a host to which there was no end. This is the great Genghis Khan and his army, come to take revenge. The walls will hold them back for now, but the Mongols lay siege to Otrar, using newfound Chinese weaponry. As the gray months pass, the nomads circle the gates and sever supply lines into the city. Many suffering Khorasmians possess only a tenuous fealty to the Shah. Some are subjects recently forced under his control, who suffer the crippling taxes he has levied to raise his army. In his despair, General Karacha rides out from the gate with his followers and defects. The Mongols welcome him into camp, only to tell him that his betrayal of the Shah reveals his own disreputation as an ally. They execute him and his officers. Traitors inside Otrar, seeking an end to the siege, open the unmanned gate and the Mongols charge in. They massacre soldiers and townspeople and pillage what they find. Inal Chuk retreats to the citadel with his remaining troops. For weeks they resist until the last soldier, and barricading himself in a hopeless room which overlooks his fallen city, the wretched Inal Chuk resorts to casting down bricks upon his foes. The Mongols drag him out and take him captive. Genghis Khan has proclaimed that the conflagration of the Khorasmian Empire has been brought on by Inal Chuk, a thief sick with greed, and so the Mongols decide to give the governor the precious medal he so desires. The Mongols pour molten silver into his eyes and ears, such that the defiant face of Inal Chuk sears inward and spills at their feet. Others contend his end was more prosaic, that the Mongols simply strangled or trampled him to death. Regardless, Inal Chuk is dead, and tens of thousands of Mongols under the Khan's generals now plunder the empire from all ends. Shah Mohammed readies his army for a final stand, galloping out to meet them before the capital city of Samarkand. But Genghis Khan and the main force have disappeared, ventured into the vast Kizilkum Desert, long thought impassable. Beneath ornate mosques, the humming markets of Bukhara have built the fortunes of aristocrats and concealed the dismal slums of the peasantry. It was here that Inal Chuk sold the plunder from the Mongol caravan. And that is why, stealing the horizon, Genghis Khan and the Mongols advance on its walls. Having traversed the dunes of the Kizokum, the Khan besieges Bukhara, using Khwarazmian prisoners as human shields in the assaults. After only a few days, thousands of troops emerge from the gate. The Mongols slaughter them and rush into the city. Genghis Khan decides to join them. One source records that the Khan addresses the city. O oh people, know that you have committed great sins. If you ask me what proof I have for these words, I say it is because I am the punishment of God. If you had not committed these sins, God would not have sent a punishment like me upon you. Scouring financial records, the Mongols identify the nobles who purchased the Khan's stolen cargo, and threaten that all who fail to return the valuables will be executed. The Mongols advance on the citadel at the city's heart, forcing their civilian prisoners forward until their bodies fill the moat, at which point the Mongols drive siege weapons over them and breach the walls, killing all of the soldiers within. Few inhabitants are spared the depredations of the pillaging Mongols, who torture the rich into relinquishing their valuables, violate screaming young women, and kill, conscript, enslave, or banish all other civilians. The city catches fire. Its mosques and slums are left in ashes as the Mongol army rides out and marches on the capital of Samarkand. The Mongols near the walls and devastate the Khwarazmian charges that come to relieve the city. Genghis Khan then learns that the Shah has threaded the Mongol line and vanished into the wilderness. He sends thousands of troops under Jebe and his finest general Subutai to track the Shah while his main force moves to finish Samarkand. The Kang, Li, and Turkic defenders in the capital ask to surrender and insist that they had never wished to resist the Mongols. 
Genghis promises them that they will be spared, but his cold pragmatism and truth permits none to resist. As soon as they give up their weapons, the Mongols kill all of them. They systematically massacre the rest of the town, sparing only a handful of useful artisans and a few women to take as concubines. And as the Shah flees, the scythe falls on each of his cities. Sporadic Khorasmian victories serve only to enrage the invaders. In Urgench, vengeful Mongol generals puncture the dams that hold back the river and drown every soul within. Later, in Nishapur, it is said that the Mongols separated into stinking piles the heads of men, women, and children, sparing almost no living thing. Dark legends of the Mongols no doubt grow wild in these lands, where Genghis has come to be called the Accursed One. The Khwarazmian throne that defied him has been deserted, for Shah Muhammad II has been hunted to the wild outskirts of his kingdom, only a day's pace ahead of Subutai and his troops. The Mongols capture most of the Shah's family. They kill all of his sons they find and take his daughters as concubines. Then they banish his mother to Mongolia to live the rest of her days in poverty and hidden on an island surrounded by the somber waves of the Caspian, the Shah yields to some disease. In the coming year of 1221, his son Jalal ad -Din will rout many Mongols and lead a Khwarazmian resistance until Genghis Khan personally crushes his army and forces him into the jungles of India. The Khan knows that in Asia and Europe there are yet many peoples and places to conquer. And so across the burning lands once claimed by the Shah, the Mongols press onward. The Mongols are already, in my opinion, the greatest warriors of all time, but I was still entranced by the documentary Timur, Mongol Messenger from Magellan TV. Actually seeing stampeding Mongol horse archers is a beautiful and terrifying thing. It's what many doomed people would have seen 800 years ago. You'll learn a lot about the Mongols in the documentary, and all History Dose viewers can go watch it for free right now. In fact, click the link in the description and you'll get an exclusive free month of membership to Magellan TV. You'll have access to Timur, Mongol Messenger, as well as Magellan's huge catalog of 3,000 history documentaries. And they're adding new documentaries in history, crime, and science every single week. So click that link and you can start streaming these through your TV, mobile device, laptop, or other streaming device right away. 